John Farquhar. I am the uh, Vice President of Community Investment at your Akron Community Foundation, and we are thrilled that you are all here today. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules, your busy calendars, to come learn more about a very important topic here in our community, uh, infant mortality, and some of the health disparities that our kids face each and every day. Um, as many of you know, many of you are grantees in our Health and Human Services cycle, and we thank you for coming today. Um, we are in the midst of our Health and Human Services cycle. We have a, a daunting task of looking at about a million dollars in requests, and we have a little over $600,000 to spend. So our, our board is, is, is committed to this process. Some of them are here today. Um, I'd like to recognize uh, Jody Constant, who is the chair of our Community Investment Committee. Uh, Katie Smucker, who is on our board. Uh, Sylvia Tondo, who is our board chair. And Sylvia, thank you for being here. Um, and I believe that's it. Anybody else in the room from the board or CI committee? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Sandy Selby is on our community investment committee as well. So thank you all yeah. for being here to, uh, to hear today's topic. Um, again, we do these on a quarterly basis. We feel it's important to present to the community um, key issues that are happening in our, in our community every day. So, um, if you don't come to these, we ask you to get on a cycle, to get on our mailing list, to make sure you're informed of when these are happening. Our uh, next cycle is our education cycle, another very important one to the foundation, uh, which will be at the end of January 2023. I can't believe I'm saying that. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Christina gonzalez Alcala, who will introduce our speakers. Thanks so much, John. Well, thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for joining us. I am excited uh, for today's presentation, our community issue session, reducing racial health disparities for infants and youth. We have a fantastic uh, couple of uh, friends here that are going to school us on, on all these issues. So uh, please welcome Shalita Smith, Director of Family Health at Summit County Public Health. <laughs> and please welcome Danico Buckley Knight, Youth and Community Opportunity Director for the City of Africa. So Shalita and Danico are going to be addressing how racism impacts physical and mental health and how evidence-based solutions improve infant vitality and youth and community safety. So we'll start with Danico who has to uh, unfortunately leave us because he coaches over at East. Uh, no, no, no rooting against East right now. So, uh, so we'll open up for him. He'll do uh, his presentation and then after he uh, finishes his presentation, then we'll open up for questions for him, and then we'll move on to Shalita's part of the presentation. All right? Thanks, Dave. Really, my goal is to give you guys a, a picture pertaining to what we're looking at trying to do to reduce violence in our community, okay? So, um, a little bit about myself. I worked for the YMCA for about 12 years. Um, I was a sport director, fitness director, uh, community program director. I um, also have some uh, mental health um, expertise, working for minority behavioral health group uh, as a case manager at Book of High School. Um, I served as the site manager for Access Point Community Health Center. 
um, and then I also work at the United Way, serving as the Family Resource Coordinator for the Kenmore Barfield Cluster. So I say that to say, like, oh, and I currently coach at East High School. Uh, so I say all of that to say, like, if you add all of the work experiences that I have and blend it all in one, really my passion is around youth and our community and how do we be able to provide opportunities for our youth. Uh, I'm a father also, so, like, I really want to make our community better than what it is for not me, but for my kids and their kids and generations to come. Um, so. Uh, going on to kind of like the 2017 violence, we had in December of 2017 a lot of murders that happened right before Christmas. Uh, a group of community organizations and leaders kind of got together to talk about ways to address that issue. And after about two years of communicating and meeting, there was an actual strategic plan that was created. Uh, and it was submitted to the mayor's office in 2019. Um, a few of the barriers were one, um, there was really no funding or resources available um, to be able to execute some of the approaches that was identified. Um, number two, there really wasn't a full-time person that was gonna push and make sure that that strategic plan gets implemented. And then number three, COVID hit. So if you add all of those things together, that basically strategic plan sat for a while. Uh, but uh, there was nine approaches eight approaches, I apologize, um, that those community organizations identified to reduce violence in the community. And those were mentorship, recreation time, reentry support, police youth relations, mental health, traumatic stress, gun violence reduction, community awareness, and then capacity. And with all of those approaches, there was basically like a lead partner that was identified to be able to really help move the needle with those areas. Um, so, uh, we, we really, I, this, this, the mayor's office, we really think that, that strategic plan was uh, well executed and well done. Project Ujima put that together for the city. Um, so, one of the things transitioning was, you know, after COVID, our entire nation was faced with the incident that occurred with George Floyd in Minneapolis. And a lot of communities, including Akron, we had to look at ourselves in the mirror uh, to be able to really address the issue. And in Akron, we created that Racial Equity Social Justice Task Force. And in that Racial Equity Social Justice Task Force, uh, let me give a shout out to her, where is she at? There you go. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about how in 2019, there was a, a strategic plan that was created and how awesome would it be to recommend for the mayor to create a position that would be a full-time liaison between the mayor's office and the community to be able to really uh, create that strategic plan and revise it if needed, but really execute what that strategic plan was. So that's what my position is. I'm now serving in that space of advocacy in that strategic plan to now serving as that role. So this is again why, like it's a passion of mine. Um, but fast forward to um, post-COVID, um, you know, a lot of cities, including Akron, received you know, millions of dollars from the American Rescue Plan Act and in Akron, uh, our mayor is really serious about you know trying to address the violence in our community. So what he did was he addressed he he allocated twenty million dollars to be able to be spent towards prevention, intervention uh, programs to be able to reduce violence in our community. And there was a five point framework that he created, um, and those those areas were prevention, uh, basically stopping the violence before it starts, intervention and support intervening in the lives of at-risk uh, individuals, uh, enforcement, uh, police and partners are essential to keeping dangerous offenders out of our neighborhoods, uh, partnership and advocacy, we need strong partnerships, effective legislation around reduced violence, and then the last one was community ac accountability, and that's reducing violence is going to take a whole Akron approach, not just the Nico and the mayor's office, it's going to take everyone that's in this, in this room and everyone that you guys are connected with. So. Um, basically, where we're at in the city is we've had two rounds of funding. Uh, we have, I think, I want to say over 20 organizations that have been uh, identified to receive um, funding around violence intervention and prevention. And currently, what we did is we opened up a third round, and that is open from October 1st to the 31st. So, any nonprofit who has an idea around how to reduce violence in the community and has a passion for their community, they're able to apply for funding. Uh, you can go to our AkronOhio.gov um, website and it'll give you information on where to go to to apply. 
Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, close that application on the 31st. In November, we're going to bring organizations in for like an interview process. And then in December, we're going to inform the community and inform those organizations who all are going to receive funding effective in 2023. Um, so what, where we're at as far as the next steps, um, continue to create opportunities to bring the community together, to get input for what we can do, to provide opportunities for our youth in order to reduce violence. So events like this, having me be a part of this, to be able to speak on behalf of the mayor's office and make you guys aware of some of the initiatives that we're doing, but not leave it at that. You guys all have my card, and if you don't, please make sure that you get one. I have a few extras over here. If there's a conversation that you feel is needed and you want to have that conversation with me, that's what my role is. Like, I'm open ears. I don't have a plan. I don't have a hype, like all of the ideas. But I do know that the community does. So I'm really going to be strategic over these next couple of weeks to getting out in the community to connect with you all. Um, the other part is the allocation of VIP funding. We are going to do one more round. Um, I just know we're not going to be able to allocate up to $20 million by the end of this year. Um, so we're going to have another round, and I'll be sure to in provide information to you. Um, so if there's anyone who may not be able to apply this go round, you know, don't be discouraged if you got a passion and an idea around the use of violence. You'll have another opportunity next year. Um, but we want to create a strategic plan. So we're going to get again continue to work with Project Eugenia, and it's going to be twofold. Uh, I spoke to a few of you today, actually, but I really want to make sure that those that were in that that space in 2019 create that strategic plan. I really want to get you guys back in the room one more time and just talk about where we're at, where we're looking at going. But then I also want to make sure that these organizations that we're funding and some of the individuals and community leaders who weren't in that space, who didn't have a voice in 2019, I want to make sure that I give them a voice as well. And then the goal is to be able to revise our strategic plan and be able to present that to the community in the spring of 2023. Um, and then the last thing um, that I wanted to talk about is that round three funding, which is what I've talked about, have already shared. But um, I'll pass, I'll leave these up here as well. There's the front and back that kind of highlights each of the organizations that we funded thus far and what they're going to be doing to address violence in our community. So you can kind of get an idea of how broad and how unique this funding opportunity is. You have organizations like Battered Women's Shelter, who, you know, for the most part, everyone in the community know what they do. But then you have organizations like the Fallen Fathers, who is really boots on the ground, more of a grassroots, but really know the kids that are doing the violence. They know the families that are highly impacted by the violence, and they're just as important as a, a Battered Women's Shelter. So, trying to make sure that we blend and get a lot of those key community stakeholders to go along with those grassroots organizations to create a strategic plan around violence intervention and prevention is really one of our next steps. So with all that being said, I'll open it up to questions before I head off and depart to East High School. But thank you for allowing me to present as well. Um, so she wanted to know at the end of the business, so yeah, like 11.59, yeah, 59, okay. <laughs> repeating at, on October 31st is when it's going to close. Perfect. And, and just transparency, if October 31st you like are three-fourths down the line ready to apply, you just don't have it ready and you want to get it to me November 1st. Oh gosh, don't say that. Like, just send me, <laughs> send me an email. Like, it's, cause I, I'm, I'm a little flexible. I just know that the, that Monday, what, what day is the 31st on? Monday. Monday. That Monday, oh, yeah, yeah, never mind. I, I retract that. You are going to be looking at it on Monday. Right. 11.59 <laughs> 11, 11, p.m. Okay. Correct, yes. Okay. Did he go to this funding that you're providing for existing programs and organizations, or are you looking for new and innovative ideas to help stop the right? Both. So there are some organizations that applied for funding like at the beginning of this year, they weren't awarded. So we encourage those organizations to apply again. There are some organizations that were awarded at the beginning of the year, but they didn't get the exact dollar amount that they thought would be beneficial to their organization, so they're reapplying right now. And then there's some organizations who weren't aware at the beginning of the year of this funding opportunities, uh, both from that high community stakeholders, but also from the grassroots level that are very interested in submitting a proposal that's going on. 
I'm expecting at least 75 to 100 proposals by the end of next week. No, Monday. Yeah, by Monday. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'm glad you asked. So, the quick process with that. So, she wanted to know about the reimbursement, the process, and how to get it funded. So, I'll give you a couple of nuggets. So, one, if you are applying, the first step is when you submit your application, we submit that over to Guidehouse, which is like our advisory consultant company. Um, they work with a number of cities throughout Ohio, but they also have a number of cities throughout the United States. And that's what their expertise is federal funding and making sure that you allocate it properly. Um, so they review that uh, that um, proposal and they provide us with like, okay, based off of our knowledge, this is a high risk, this is a medium risk, this is a low risk. It doesn't mean if you're low, you're going to get funded, or if you're high, you're not going to get funded. But it's just something to be, you know, consider take into consideration. The next step is we'll bring bring that organization in, and we allow that organization to present to a number of different community leaders and organizations. So it's usually about five to seven individuals. And at that time, they'll have about a 30 minute window to talk about their proposal. And then those, in, those individuals who are part of the interview panel will then ask questions related to their proposal. And then the third stage is we blend what Guy House says uh, along with what the interview panel says. And we schedule a one on one meeting to, uh, with Mayor Morgan to talk about the pros and cons based off of both lenses. And then the ultimate decision is made by, by the big guy. Um, so um, that's the stage, but then what happens is because of the process of creating an application, I mean, creating the contract, getting everything signed, and then getting the funds allocated for your organization, that's usually about a two-month process. So we're hoping that by December of this year, all of the organizations are going to be informed um, what they're going to get for a funding standpoint. Um, we're hoping that by February, those contracts are finalized and signed from all parties. And then what's going to happen is effective in January, if you're awarded uh, funding, you can begin spending funding if you have it in your organization. And then in February, you'll submit those receipts, those payroll information, everything that's related to your expense report, and we'll provide you with a reimbursement, a reimbursement check. There's some other organizations, especially those that are more grassroots, that are saying, you know what, I'll just wait until my contract is completely signed, sealed, delivered, I'll wait until I know that I got X amount of dollars in my city uh, city account, and then I'll start requesting for funding so I can get out and do my program. So it's, it's really more so as we get to that process to say, hey, listen, congratulations, your organization is going to be awarded X amount of dollars. I then have that more one-on-one -on -one dialogue to say, okay, organization A is interested in starting effective January 1, so we're going to reimburse them whatever they submit for receipts and payroll versus, hey, this organization isn't going to be able to start until February. And then when February comes, they're going to want probably an upfront fund so they can start their program and then they'll submit re receipts at that time. So it's a little bit of both. It's a both end. North Hill and East Akron has some really staggering statistics. So my question is, for programs that are focused on those neighborhoods that had high statistics of like violent offenders, if you will, how is the city um, uh, like analyzing how well those programs performed, if they were successful or not? And will there be opportunities outside of these dollars that are allocated for ARPA for them to be a part of additional funding if they were successful? Yeah, so, uh Ask your first part. Um, when it comes to how we measure success, we have like two different categories. We have a category that's just basic stuff like related to how many number of students did you have? How many students um, were enrolled in your program? How many absences did they miss in school and in your program? Were they involved with any um, incidents at school or in your program that resulted in punishment related to fights or altercations? Um, um, did you make any referrals for wraparound service? If any of those organizations or any of these individuals in mental health services? So those are like, no matter what, who, whatever organization is getting funded, we're kind of going to expect for you to be able to uh, provide data related to that area. But then the second part is, again, what we don't want to do is we don't want to just make it 
that data only is what we're looking for. So we gave each organization the opportunity in addition to what we're looking for to create their own scope of work to say, okay, if you give us funding, what we're gonna do is A, B, C, D, and E, and this is how we think it's gonna reduce violence. So it's, it's both data-driven, every organization has specifics around about seven or eight different areas, and then it's also based off of your organization. We don't want you to only fit in these seven or eight areas. We want you to be transparent say, if I get this funding, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna open up an after-school program. We currently have 20 kids. I'm gonna get 80 kids in my program now. And we may be able to get five of those 80 kids a job. If that's what your scope of work is, and that's kind of what we're holding you accountable for. But on a monthly basis, I meet with each organization and we have conversations. So if there's any successes that are really successful, tell me about them. If there's any challenges that are really challenging, tell me about them. And then the last thing is we're working with Kent State, Akron U, and Akron Public, I mean, and APD to really be able to look at all of Akron to identify the hot spots. Because again, we want to provide professional intervention programs for everyone, but from doing research in other cities, the biggest uh, impact is when you really deal with that 10% of young adults that's doing 90% of the crime. So that's kind of like where we want to work with Kent, Akron, and APD to say, all right, here's our three or four hot spots. How do we really be a little bit more intensive in these areas because they need more than just after school program, you know what I mean? Yes. Are you planning to use all of the 20 million for these grant proposals and what happens to these programs after that money runs out? Glad you asked. So when I took this position, that was one of my big concerns. That's the last thing I wanted to do was take this role, allocate funding, and then two years from now it's all gone and be like, well, what happened to our community? Well, we took the money away. Um, one of the things that I'm noticing, and it's similar to kind of like our, our, our community, we're, we're doing a lot better in transition, that infant mortality, right? A few years ago, multiple years now, you know, not so many people were talking about infant mortality, right? Now, the community talks about infant mortality, and we're, we know how passionate um, folks like Shalita is, and we know how passionate our community is to reduce that infant mortality number. So what I'm noticing now is that's the trend in our nation. The nation coming out of COVID is every city, especially mid or major cities, is having issues around violence. So now there's funding being allocated around violence intervention and prevention. So ideally, in my perfect world, what we're gonna be doing is creating a strategic plan next spring, but the next step is how do we, as one voice, as one team around Akron and reducing violence and providing opportunities, how do we really leverage ourselves to be able to apply for funding from a local, state, federal uh, standpoint, but then also looping in folks like Akron Community Foundation, <laughs> right? Because I feel like that's kind of like where we can really be impactful. Uh, we can't just have five or six organizations connecting around violence intervention and prevention to all of the who's who's. We need 150 organizations connected around violence and adventure prevention, and we are all coming together to be able to identify funds to be able to disseminate that appropriately. And then the other part is, of the 20 million, we did not have all 20 million that's gonna to go towards programming. Um, some of that funding will go towards security cameras in the city um, to be able to you know, address some of the violence that happens. Um, some of it is gonna to go towards personnel to be able to add additional staff but there's gonna be a significant amount of that 20 million that's going to the community. And that is, a, that is Mayor Horton's vision. He did not want it to go to just a handful. Some, of, some A lot of cities are just saying, look, this is the money that we got, we're gonna give it to these seven play, players in the community and let them disseminate it all the way out. Our mayor was like, no, we need to get grassroots, we need to get whoever has an idea and a vision around violence intervention and prevention the opportunity. So that's kind of like what we're trying to do trying to create a strategic plan and then work collectively to be able to identify additional resources from the local, state, and federal so we can all sustain ourselves moving forward. Where you go? I got one. <laughs> Thank you. So you and I, we, we, we tend to wear multiple hats, multi-career. So the Nico, take your city of Akron hat off. As the Nico, coach, you've been with you working for a really long time. You mentioned community, Accountability. We have the community here. How is the community held? How is it think of village? What do you feel like we need to do as a community to reduce and to increase safety? 
Um, that's right. So if I could just put one thing on it, listen to the young adults. Yes. Provide them with a space, provide them with an opportunity to hear, to, 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 to hear what is it that they think they need. Um, and I'll share real quick. We had in late August an event right here at the Urban League um, due to the incident with Jalen Walker, the tragedy, um, the Department of Justice carried the act ring. And one of the things that they wanted to do was have dialogue around like the faith-based community um, to just see how we can come together from the standpoint of you know law and the community. Well, I talked about like I'm in this youth and community opportunity space. Like, can we have a conversation with the young adults? So they helped uh, Urban League, uh, helped myself, City of Akron, and facilitate the dialogue. We had about 30 young adults here. And basically we talked about what are the great things that happens in Akron. And they talked about all of the great things in Akron. Then we shifted and talked about what are some of the challenges in Akron. 16, 17, 18, 19 year olds, oh my gosh. Usually you're pulling teeth. But because we gave them that platform to be able to like be transparent and say, oh, so you want to know what, your, what, what the problems are? <laughs> well, here's the problems, right? So they talked about the problems, right? And then we did lunch and we had these 30 young adults uh, uh, grade based off of the 15, 20 different problems that were up. What are the top four? Um, they came up with their top four and then the next solution was come up with a plan and come up with a budget. And we had representation from you know the deputies from the mayor's office that was here. We had some pastors that was here. But the four areas that they talked about was like education, um, and specifically like they wanted holistic education. They don't want it to just be books. They wanted to be a holistic education. They talked about community and police relations. Again, I'm 40. You ask a 40 year old at the time of the Jane and Walker incident, anything about the police? It's screw the police. Defund them, get them out of our community, right? The young adults was like, we like the police. They got a tough job. We think the police should come a little bit more often to our communities. How, how can we bridge the gap? Can we play basketball against them? Can we create opportunities where it ain't just them showing up because an incident happened in our neighborhood? It's them showing up because they know that we're youth and we know that they're police and we need to blend the relationship. It's like, wait a minute, you guys got all the answers to the problems, and that really transitioned my brain, because I've been meeting with all kinds of organizations since March, and in August, I finally had a conversation with 30 young adults, and I'm like, no. What we gotta do is we need to listen to them, because 10 years from now, the 16-year-old is gonna be 26, looking at trying to purchase his first home, looking at determining whether Akron is the place to raise their children or not. So they're gonna be able to come up with more practical solutions around the problem of violence in our community versus a 40-year-old me, although I have knowledge 16 year olds really do. So I would encourage you all to be strategic around the work that you do and at least have one or multiple conversations that you're bringing young adults in to allow their voice to be heard. But don't just leave it there. Make sure that once it's heard, you provide feedback, you provide follow-ups, you connect them with me. And I'll be more than willing to help them, uh, you know, try to push some of their, their ideas and initiatives. So that would be my best um, advice is to just be open to the young adults because they talk about at school, the teachers, they do a good job, but the teachers aren't there to hear what they're talking about. The counselors are there to make sure that they graduate. The parents are there to make sure that they go to school, but the parents aren't really there to listen to them. So creating that space in the community where they're being heard will be my number one advice to you all. Thanks, Nick. organizations that are getting funded dollar amount and like a paragraph of what they're going to be doing so you guys can see that holistic approach along with a few different cards. Thank you.
when we talk about disparity, okay? This is Summit County data. Um, this is not national data, this is local data, okay? Um, and also, I will be sure to share these brief slides um, with everybody um, once we're complete, so don't feel the need to take a picture if you would like to. Um, so, my job today is to talk a little bit about infant mortality and then talk about the vitality that we're doing in our community and how it's making overall impact. So when we talk about infant mortality, we're talking about the death of a child before his or her first birthday, okay? So this is an overview of what infant mortality is and our leading causes of infant death in our community. We've been working on infant mortality since 2013. I have not been in this role since 2013, but we've been working on infant mortality since 2013. In 2013, the Ohio Department of Health um, created like a collaborative with 10 people, nine counties at the time in the state that represented most of the black infant deaths in our community, 80% of the black infant deaths in our community, okay? So these um, 10, these nine counties came together and they worked on strategies. They called them upstream strategies and downstream strategies. And what the intent behind it was, what can we do basically policy related to drive change? And then what can we do like prevention once an individual becomes pregnant to drive change, okay? So since then, a lot of things have occurred across the state and there's been a lot of changes. Um, and we're really trying to use data to move the, um, the needle, but also we're realizing that we have to talk to the individuals that are offering, obviously suffering from these losses and bringing the community into the overall conversation. So this is our infant mortality rate over a 10 year period. Um, as you can see, <coughs> we have the Summit County um, white and black infant mortality rate as well as the state's white and black infant mortality rate. Um, they're pretty much the same for the most part. Um, as you can see, our numbers are trending sometimes a little bit lower than the state, um, but for the most part, there's a huge, there's, it, it kind of plateaus. Um, we look at our years by five year averages, okay? Five year averages is the way that we tend to look at our numbers. And the reason that we do that is because as you can see, our black infant mortality rate for actually 2020 was 10.2, okay? That's the lowest it's been since basically 2012, which is great, right? But if you take the five-year average of it, we're really right on par almost with what the state's black infant mortality rate is. So when realistically, we're going up and we're going down and we're going back up, so we're really not making that big of a difference at this point in time. Also, something that we have to take into consideration is that our um, our birth numbers are declining nationally especially in the state of Ohio okay so recently um, I just pulled 2021 data and our um, birth numbers are the lowest they've been in a very 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 long time um, we were averaging we used to average about 6,000 births a year um, over the last couple years we've been in the 5,800 round um, in 2021, we only had like 5,600 births. Um, so we're consistently declining. Um, there's multiple reasons for that. If you look at data, um, a lot of people are getting pregnant later in life. A lot of individuals are choosing not to have children for various reasons. Um, so there's a lot of things that come into play when we talk about that. Um, but these are things that we obviously take into consideration when we talk about infant mortality and the overall effects in our community. Um, one of the things I would like to bring into play is there's black births represent 37% of our overall births in the state of Ohio. 37% of our births in the state of Ohio are to black individuals, but they represent 73% of the black deaths, of our deaths as a whole. So 37% of our births are black, 73% of the deaths are black. So you guys see the disparity. So our black babies are dying almost three times the rate of our white babies in our community. In the state of Ohio, there's about three babies that die every single day. Every single day, okay? So we have a lot of work to do. Um, one of the things that we talk about that's heavily focused in our community is sleep-related deaths. Um, this is a graph that shows our sleep-related deaths from 2015 to 2020. As you can see, there's a varying um, rate in information. Um, and actually that is that 2019 have been correct. My apologies, and I will fix that before it goes out. Um, in 2019, um, we actually had our highest sleep related deaths, which was actually 14. Um, and that was what drove us to do instrumental change and do a different 
approach to how we talk about sleep sleeping information in our community. Um, so we have, um, which I'm going to talk about in a second, we have used this information to drive community change and how we instrument a strategic plan that has came out of the collaborative full term first of that. Um, when we talk about sleep related deaths, one of the biggest things we talk about is co sleeping um, and the importance of not sleeping with your child. Um, also, making sure that you are having the conversation with everybody who encounters your child. Child's, children take naps, a lot of naps, right? So just because someone may be watching your child for an hour or two hours, they need to have the proper education and proper information in order to make sure that they know what to do and the best way to put the child to sleep, okay? Um, so we've been working diligently with After Children's Hospital as well as our community partners to make sure that information is widespread. So I did put a couple articles here. Um, that first one is one that just came out like six days ago. Um, and the title of it is very alarming, right? Mothers, babies more likely to die in some Northeast Ohio counties than in most of the other counties. That's Summit and Cuyahoga only, y'all. That's only two counties, Summit and Cuyahoga. Um, and if you watch, there's a clip, there's a video clip, and then there's an article um, with some people giving some testimonies. Um, and there's some data included in there about Summit and Cuyahoga. And it's very, very alarming. And it actually instantly made me cry because there's so much that we need to do in our community and our black women and our black families are truly suffering. And I don't, me personally, don't know why. Um, there is a lot that ties into it, but we have a lot more work to do, right? Um, the Ohio Infant Mortality Reports, um, those are reports that started in 2018, and that's a link with all the reports, so definitely want to get that. And then we have full-term first birthday. So full-term first birthday is a collective impact collaborative that started in 2017, and I am the co-director with Tamika Rose. Um, together, we serve as the leading entities that kind of drive the, some of the decisions that are coming out of that collaborative. Um, in 2017, um, we decided that we needed to come together to talk about how we can implement consistent change in our community and be innovative, right? Because the things that we were doing, it, it was working, but we really weren't getting the results that we felt like we needed to get. Um, through that collaborative, we've been able to get um, grant dollars from the Ohio Department of Health and Ohio Department of Medicaid. We've been able to bring in non-traditional grassroots organizations into the circle to talk about infant mortality and come up with innovative strategy um, to reduce um, some of the social determinants and health that we're seeing on the day-to-day. -day. Um, and also we've been able to implement a more community-based approach, including community members at the table when we're having these conversations. When we started this, we had a strategic plan that started in 2018 and it went through 2022. It was okay, um, but we got a lot of feedback from it that it was very baseline, it was very general, and it wasn't doing the work that we felt like we needed to do. And also, we weren't able to track a lot of it because of COVID. Um, just being very transparent, COVID really impacted a lot of our programs. So we, when we went back to the drawing board to do a strategic plan, um, we decided to take a very different approach. We decided to look at the data, but we also decided to take some realistic feedback that we received from the first strategic plan. And one of the first things that we heard was, we didn't do a good job of actually calling out the issue. And the issue is that our black babies are dying. And we have to do more for the black community. Um, so very thankful for our partners in Summit County. Um, United Way made um, infant mortality, especially the black infant mortality rate, decreasing it a whole goal. So that's something to be very proud of. Um, and that's, we're working very heavily with the United Way. Um, the mayor has been obviously a front ground runner in terms of infant mortality and how it's affecting our black community. And then same from the health department standpoint in our hospitals, definitely making it a strategic priority as we move forward and talk about this work. But the interesting part about the strategic plan is we did a couple different things. We talked about calling out black infant mortality, which we did. We also looked at how we can make sure that this work is sustainable moving forward. Um, just like Tanika was saying, we know that a lot of this funding is today funding. We know that it's not necessarily eight years, ten years from now funding. Um, infant mortality did not happen overnight, so we need to stop approaching it as it came out overnight. Babies have been dying, unfortunately, for a very, very long time, but we in the state of Ohio, but really nationally, 
started looking at this very heavily in like 2010, okay? So we have a lot of work to do over a very long period of time. Um, but with that approach, um, we have a very unique plan um, where we have levels of influence, so it gives people the opportunity to sit where they fit, right? So there's like community level, there's society level, if you feel like you want to help with advocacy, you could be there. And don't feel that you have to do it just from the organization of which you work in, it could be you as an individual and how you want to serve. So I'm definitely excited for that. That's something the strategic plan is out. It is actually on the Bull Turn First Birthday website. Um, these are active links, so you'll be able to click on that page to see the very information. Also, um, we will have, along with the different levels of influence, we do have metrics and action items that are coming out of that. So individuals who are running these levels of influence, we do have chairs loosely put, I don't know their actual names yet, but they will be uh, making sure that the information is provided back on a regular basis. Um, a couple of things that have came out that are innovative from some of the data that we've received. In 2019, um, we had data from one of our programs that specifically focused on pregnant women that 60% of the individuals that were screened for the program indicated that they had some type of housing instability. So that could be that they were 100% homeless, that they were couch surfing, or they were living in their car and didn't know where their next group was gonna be in their head. So with that information, we decided to begin our work with CareSource and a couple other managed care kids to really advocate for a program that was piloted in Columbus called Healthy Beginnings at Home. Um, we're very fortunate to where we were able to get some funding, and Healthy Beginnings at Home is now a real thing in Summit County. So we are working on a research-based program where we are providing uh, housing to pregnant women um, for two years. Um, it's very detailed, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but it's very detailed and we're able to serve 30 women. This is very exciting for us because we're hoping that this information can say that if you have a stable roof over your head, you will have a better chance of having a healthy pregnancy. Um, the information and the um, results of the pilot was just amazing, absolutely phenomenal. Um, so the fact that we're able to do this program is truly grateful. Um, also, we were able to use some of the work um, and data that we received from the same program to talk about workforce development. So um, the city of Akron worked with United Way to create a housing mitigation fund, um, which was sponsored by um, some private donors and things of that nature, which is so amazing. But we were like, okay, we're giving $700 for you to pay your rent or to pay your utilities, but what's your long-term plan, right? So we created a workforce development program um, in collaboration with The Well. They already had a program going, um, but they worked with us to kind of adapt the program to serve pregnant women and families. Um, and with that being done, um, they created a piece where there's, uh, there's child care involved, there's food when you come to the meetings, you get transportation to the meetings, um, you get a mentor when you're at the meetings, and if you complete the program, which is five to six weeks, by the end of the program, you are guaranteed a job interview. You're not guaranteed a job, but you are guaranteed an interview. And you have soft skills so that when you go to try to get a job other places, you have the knowledge level and the skill set in order to do so. Um, also with this, we've been able to focus on other things that we know are consistent issues in our community. We've been able to include lactation support. Um, we had fatherhood in our initiatives um, a couple years ago, um, and then they kind of, I don't know what happened, but they died down. But we do have fatherhood back in our initiatives um, in 2022, which is truly amazing because we know it takes two to have a child at the end of the day, and we need to make sure that significant others are included in the conversation. And it's more than just, is your father, is the father of the child in your kid's life? No, it's more than that, right? It's making sure that you, there's proper education, even if they're not in the, child, in the child's life, or when you're um, talking about how to be active and how to be supportive and what that means to be in that role. So we've been able to really expand our options, expand our resources, um, talk to varying partners, and I truly feel like we're at a place where if you come to Tamika and I with a suggestion or an intervention, we will take it into consideration. But please know, we ask a lot of questions. I like to call myself a question master. So my first question is, okay, that's great, but what results are you trying to get from it? Okay, that's great, how are you gonna sustain it? Because that's really big, like Danico said, we don't wanna put things into the community that we can't sustain. 
And I think we've done a really good job over the last five years, for the most part, putting things out into the community and having them grow, okay? So we need to make sure that they're sustainable and we need to make sure that they're actual things that the community needs in order to flourish. Because a lot of times we're like, oh, that kind of exists already, maybe you should just hook up with X organization to make it a little bit better, right? Um, so really providing that linkage, that community support and that backbone to figure out how we can make our community more successful and make sure that our babies have a healthy future. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. In the aftermath of the tragic loss of babies, is there follow up with the moms done that would not promote any traumatic, you know, traumatic recollection, but gaining from them what they think? So yes, yes, I'm gonna say yes. So the question was, is there anything being done after the loss of a child to know that the family is supported um, and to make sure that there's a proper proper care given to the families that have lost a child, basically. Um, so we have a program called the Fetal Infant Mortality Review, um, and that more so focuses on fetal loss. So that's a loss that occurs 20 weeks gestation um, up until basically 40 weeks, but it's in utero, right? So we have a program um, where we're contacting with like a letter that's very, very soft, um, inviting, saying, well, we're sorry for your loss. Um, we want to provide you group resources, tell them their availability for additional support, because a lot of people don't realize that after you lose a, a baby, a fetal, have a fetal loss, you still are eligible for waiting for six months. Six months. Um, so we provide that information, um, how to make sure that you can get a copy of your fetal death certificate and those things. Um, but we also open the door for an opportunity to have a conversation and an interview with um, one of a, a nurse, a community health worker, whatever you feel comfortable with, so that we can make sure that your voice is heard. Because a lot of times we hear that people are angry, and a lot of times they're not angry at themselves, they're angry at the healthcare professionals, they're angry at family members, they're angry at their social determinants of health and the different things that were going on in their life at the time. And they want to vent, they want to talk to someone. And they want to be heard. Um, so we do take that information if an interview is given and we use that to drive change and recommendations into the community. Um, so that's the fetal infant mortality review. As far as infant loss, um, that is an option for infant loss as well. But a lot of times um, we experience that a lot of people who lose an infant do not want to talk about it. They just don't want to relive that um, because they usually get to hold them it's usually a lot of our cases are like a couple days old, obviously 30 days old, so on and so forth. So they don't want to relive that experience. Um, but Greek resources are offered. Um, all of our hospital staff that work in that avenue, especially so social workers, are well versed on that. Um, we do offer um, something called the Maternal Depression Network, which is a listing of uh, behavioral health providers in our community that gets you into services very fast, um, as well as offer opportunities for Greek resources resources as a group. So that's something that um, all of our providers are well versed in. Um, and then I know that our faith-based community does a really good job of offering different um, resources through that avenue as well. You're very welcome. any common denominators or things that we're seeing as far as the loss of a child? Um, actually, yes. Um, and one of the biggest things that we're seeing is uh, the baby tends to stop, there's conversation, that the baby tends to stop moving at some point. And then there's a, either a delay of going to the hospital, or we don't go to the hospital, or our uh, pregnant individuals are not educated enough to know that the baby has stopped moving, or they don't know the frequency of the movement of the child. Um, so actually, currently, at this point, um, we're doing, we're surveying our um, participants that are involved in WIC, that are pregnant and have had a baby within, um, that are at least three months postpartum, and we're talking, we're surveying OBGYNs to talk about what is your uh, measures and what is your uh, 
how to talk about kick counts and then the importance of kick counts, and as far as what to do um, if there is increased movement of the fetus inside your body, um, how, how do you react? So we're going through that survey process right now um, because that is a consistent theme that has always been mentioned in every Sarah interview that we've had. Um, so it's obviously something that um, needs to be um, worked on, um, but we don't really know if that's from the provider side and how the providers are giving the education or how the intervention, how the education is being interpreted by the family members and the individual that's pregnant. Um, and the reason I say that is because I think a large part of health in general is the literacy level of the health and how it's portrayed. Um, so we don't talk about health literacy enough. Um, it's hard to talk about chronic disease. It's hard to talk about diabetes. It's hard talking about cholesterol. Um, so it's very important that we take into consideration that um, when we're having these conversations, we're explaining it at the level that someone can understand it, and we're doing our due diligence of asking the questions to make sure that it's understood. A lot of times we just take the information and just hope that's interpreted, but we're not asking those, like, do you have any questions for me? Do you understand what this can mean if, this, if you don't do X, Y, and Z? We have to do a better job of teaching as we're doing this as well. So that's something that we're talking about um, in our work, but definitely, um, as you indicated, um, kick counts is something Don't need to 
capitalize on what we're doing good. And we do a lot of good, right? Um, and more importantly, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to use qualitative data to tell the stories of our community and not just talk about the numbers. Because there's so many success stories, but also I do have those stories that, not, that are as good too. Um, but one thing I do want to say um, before I kind of get kicked off here is um, housing is a really, really bad issue in our community. Um, I, we, just had a, we just had a young woman who called us a couple days ago who indicated that she's sleeping under a bridge. She, oh, she's three months pregnant. She's sleeping under a bridge. She's living in a vacant building. Um, she didn't know where she was going to get food, so on and so forth. Um, she was able to get a phone from someone. Um, at, I don't think it's Tent City anymore, but whatever. Um, but she was, I'm going to call an Obama phone because I don't know what's actually called anymore, but she was able to get an Obama phone so she could call somebody. Um, and she, the first place she called was 211, which is amazing. And then they connected her with the community health worker at our health department. From that alone, um, we were able to start the conversation of how we can get her into hotel housing, things like that. The bad part about that is, I think this individual is so used to being by herself and being and surviving that we were not able to connect with her to get her to where she needed to be. Um, but the lines of communication are open so that when she does call back, we can, we, can, we can work with her to do so. But what I'm telling you, we don't have all the success stories, right? It's all, not all glimmer and roses, and that's just a very, very small taste of, of a, a series of situations that we see every day. We had someone who came in a couple days ago that came in for diapers. She told us that she was addicted to fentanyl. We had a conversation with her at that point in time when we were able to get her into resources. It works. The wraparound services do work but that communication has to be there and we have to be open to that. So I know one of the questions that Christina asked to me go was, how do you guys play a part in this conversation? And really it's educating yourself and educating everybody around you. Um, our babies are our future. They're the people that's gonna take care of us. They're the people that are gonna be our future doctors. They're the people that are gonna be our future police officers, firemen, so on and so forth. And we have to be into a better job of holding our young women, our young men, our current kids accountable because at the end of the day, it takes a village to take care of our community. So please talk to anybody that you know that's interested in having a child. Make sure they're going to the doctor, make sure you're going to the gym, taking care of yourself. And mental health matters, y'all. So please, please self-care, behavioral health. We have to decrease that stigma that is currently existing, especially in the black community around mental health. We all have to be our whole self in order to show up. Um, so it's very important that we're doing what we need to do and what's best for us. So thank you so much. If anybody has any questions, you can email me. Um, I will make sure that um, you guys get this presentation. And I just thank you.